In our final video here, we're going to be learning about mastering with compression and learning about some of the fundamental ideas that go into using compression during a mastering session. Now to really get a grasp of some of the concepts and ideas, I'm going to revisit a topic that we haven't discussed since one of the very early chapters, and that is apparent loudness of a file or RMS loudness. You might remember that our RMS loudness or average loudness is how our ears perceive loudness over time. It has less to do with the instantaneous peaks of our transients and more to do with the average power as our audio signal progresses in time. Now to kind of get you thinking a little bit differently as to how we can approach mixing for a mastering session, we're gonna take a look at a couple of simple drum loops here. So I'm gonna play a couple of these drum loops back here and then we're going to take a look at our peak meters and I think you'll notice something quite interesting. So here's our first drum loop. And here's our second. Okay, so the most obvious thing that you probably noticed is that this drum loop sounds a lot louder than this drum loop. Now, when we look at it visually on our waveform and on our peak meters, you'll see that this drum loop is actually quite a bit higher than this drum loop. But this drum loop sounds louder than this drum loop. And that has to do with the average loudness over time. And you can start to see some of these differences when we look at it on a typical RMS meter. So I'm gonna insert an RMS meter here. And now we'll see the difference between the two files on an RMS meter. So one of the goals with using compression when mastering is really going to be level matching, especially when you're composing a disc full of a whole bunch of different tracks that you want to sound like they belong together. So some type of RMS or loudness meter is an indispensable tool to have, especially when we're talking about mastering. So if you remember in the bonus content folder, we have our mixed level three file, which we have here, and this is all ready to be mastered. You can see that it's actually quite a nice looking file. When we compare this to another modern rock mix that's already been mastered, you can see that there's actually quite a difference in the waveform. And this is what I was talking about in the previous chapter about referencing material that's already been mastered. When you go to mix down, you don't really want your mix down to look like this file because it's not really gonna give you much room to work with when mastering. I'm just gonna play this back on mute again and we'll take a look at our RMS meter. So you can see our RMS meter is actually going quite high. It's right around minus six or so on that needle. You can actually see this minus six up here too. This is our RMS level here. Now this is about as hot as I've seen some modern mixes. Anything much above this and it just kind of sounds distorted and it doesn't really sound right. And even if you were to take a listen to this file, it is actually quite distorted, but this is a major label release. Now, if we compare our mix to some other mixes that I've gotten for mastering, we can see one right here that was a mix down from a console. And you can see that it also has quite a nice waveform and we can kind of see some subtle inner dynamics in the middle of this file here. When we play this back, you can see that we're hovering right around minus 16 or so. And if we compare that to ours at the loudest section, we're still at around minus 15, minus 14 or so. So when you're mixing down, RMS values are kind of something that you do want to pay attention to because if they are too high, and you try to make your mix sound like one of these commercial mixes, you're not gonna leave yourself much room to work with. Now I do just wanna show you this one mix down that I did receive that needed to be mastered. And I, unfortunately I had to send it back to be remixed. If your mixes are looking like this out of your DAW, they're just simply too hot to be mastered. So if you're gonna be doing this out of your DAW, just make sure that something like this would be closer to your final product. When we play this back, we're already seeing levels that we would typically get after mastering. So unless you really wanted to give your mastering guy a bad day, bring down that master fader a little bit during your mix down. 
Okay, so off the topic of loudness and back to compression. Compression does have a direct effect on our loudness, as you saw in our mixing videos. So when I'm approaching mastering, the very first thing that I really try to contain are some of these inner dynamics in our audio signal. And by the inner dynamics, I'm talking about our average loudness over time. If we go too heavy, we start to lose the overall transition from soft to loud, and then our mix starts sounding just dynamically flat, lifeless, and loud. So I always like to remind myself of some of those fundamentals before I attack a master with a whole bunch of compression. But ultimately, we do live in a modern age, and we do have a certain responsibility to our clients to make sure that their mixes compete with other people in the industry. And since we're taking that approach, we might as well take the high road and do it with a little bit of class and a little bit of style and attention to some of the details. So there's a lot of tricks that we can do to kind of coax a few extra dB here and there by using compression. Now, this is one of my favorite tricks that I learned a long time ago, and I honestly don't even remember where I learned it, but it has been a godsend during mastering. And it's one of those tricks that's kind of invisible. You can't touch it, taste it, see it, or smell it. It's just there, and you don't know what it is, and you can't put your finger on it. We can really kind of start to even out some of the inner dynamics by using serial compression but in very microscopic phases. Now, I'm actually going to insert one of our super clean digital compressors, it's not really going to impart any tone. This is our Milda Production M Dynamics plugin, which by the way are great mastering plugins. You can actually make them internally upsample up to 16 times your sample rate, just in case you're looking for some cool new plugins to play around with. Plus the interfaces are all graphics accelerated, so you get some super smooth and fast metering that you really don't get with other plugins. So this microscopic compression that I'm talking about, it was just a trick that I had picked up a long time ago. Like I was saying, I don't even remember where it was, but it was kind of just using a decimal value, like a 1.1 to one ratio, but we're actually like bringing down the threshold quite far. And when you start to change some of the attack and release settings, you can really manipulate some of those inner dynamics that you can't really reach with standard compressors or peak limiters. All right, so we have a 1.07 to one ratio. We're gonna take it out of bypass here. Let's see how low our threshold is. Now the attack I found doesn't have too much of an effect on the sound as the release. You can see the gray gain reduction meter immediately to the right. It's kind of just flattened out. It only wavers a little bit, and those are the microdynamics that are rising and falling. You always want to bypass and check your mix. So we're going to start to bring up some of our makeup gain here and try to match the loudness level from when it's bypassed as compared to compressed. Now if we compare the bypass versus compressed signal, you can hear a little bit more roundness when it's on bypass. So that's kind of a neat trick and feel free to experiment with stacking those up, even with serial compression and parallel compression. Now two of my favorite mastering compressors are actually our variable mu compressors. They really have the ability of just being super transparent and acting kind of like as the glue to our mix. And that is our Fairchild 670 and also our Manly variable mu. Now this has some really interesting settings that can really make this compressor super transparent. First we have our input gain that kind of feeds the gain reduction circuit. So the harder we push our signal into the gain reduction circuit, the more compression we get. Now the other thing that affects compression is this headroom dial, which is kind of like a trim pot. And I like to think of this headroom trim pot as more of like a ratio setting because it behaves in a similar way. A few other features are our recovery, which would also be known as our release. We have a variable attack setting so that we can manipulate our transients. We have the ability to mix our dry signal in with our wet compressed signal, which is our parallel compression. 
And we even have a high pass filter that we can engage on the side chain. This will roll off the low end so that those lower frequencies don't throw our gain reduction circuit out of whack. So let's try this one and see what we can get out of our file here. So I've dialed in some ridiculously heavy settings. See when we bring that headroom knob up, we're really crushing this mix, but it still sounds surprisingly clean for the amount of gain reduction we have. One reason why I love these tube compressors. Now a nice slow recovery or slow release and a fast attack is really the key to peak limiting and peak compression during mastering. So even with that, you can hear how transparent sounding that compressor is, even with high amounts of gain reduction. Now both the Manly Variable Mu and also our Fairchild 670 has another unique feature that's great for mastering. And it actually splits the left and right sides of the compressor up into separate channels. So not only do they have the ability of compressing the left and right channels of a stereo signal, but by moving it into lat vert or lateral vertical or mid side mode, we can actually make one side of the compressor just compress the mono or middle part of our audio signal while the other one compresses the side material. And what's in the side material is actually just kind of like the photo negative of information that is identical in both channels. So it's basically still a mono audio signal, but it's the opposite of what appears in both channels simultaneously. And to make that work with both the Manly and the Fairchild 670, you have to take the controls out of stereo link mode. And by doing this, you can gain individual control over the middle of the signal and the side of the signal. Another one of your best friends in mastering is definitely going to be the multiband compressor. One of the first things I do with a multiband compressor is solo out each one of the individual crossover bands and adjust them to the sweet spots in the file where the instruments seem to naturally separate into different bands. Now it takes a little bit of practice, but you'll certainly get the feel of it when you start adjusting the bands on these multiband compressors. Once you have the bands set, you can start to bring down the thresholds and control the levels of each individual band of the file. And last but not least, the very last guy in your mastering chain is going to be what we call a brick wall limiter. Now we do have one that's built into our software here, but it actually does a pretty good job and it ensures that no matter how loud our signal gets, it will never ever let a peak exceed this given threshold, or at least in an ideal situation, that would be the case. Now you'll recall that any compressor that has a ratio of 10 to one or higher is considered a limiter. The difference between that and a brick wall limiter is that a brick wall limiter has ratios of 20 to one and higher. So it's just simply just in a different classification. Really, you'll just use these as a last line of defense. And typically you'll just set your threshold anywhere from minus 0.03 to minus 0.1. And it'll ensure that your audio signal doesn't clip or you get any digital overs or digital errors when you burn a CD. It's kind of an indispensable tool that you need to have in your mastering toolkit for sure. So I hope you guys got a lot out of this series. I certainly enjoyed taking the time to put together all of this information for you. And again, another thanks to our friends over at Universal Audio and Manly Labs just for their generous support with helping us to make this series happen for you guys. So until next time, my name's Dave Askew, and we'll see you in the next series.